The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. It was a cold and ordinary morning on November 29, 1987, when Korean Air Flight 858 departed from Baghdad en route to Seoul, South Korea. And I'm going to tell you a story about an individual who took that flight, and how that one decision affected the lives of 115 people. The passenger's name was Kin Hyun Hui. She was born in Pyongyang, North Korea on January 27, 1962. Her upbringing was relatively privileged. Her father was a career diplomat, and as a result, her life was radically different from those around her. She would frequently travel to, and eventually live for a short period, in Cuba. Kim excelled as a student, and this was the direct result of having access to some of the best schools that North Korea and Cuba had to offer. While she was completing her high school education, Kim decided to study and train to become an actress, and she was successful. She would have the opportunity to act in the first ever Technicolor film created in North Korea. After achieving that goal, Kim decided to enroll in Pyongyang University, and specifically majored in foreign studies where she studied Japanese. However, she had barely begun her studies when she was recruited for work, the work being explicitly tied to her acting ability. You see, she was recruited to become a spy, specifically for the North Korean government. For the North Korean military, this was an easy pick. She was the daughter of a prominent diplomat, and her acting skills were stellar. Soon after joining the North Korean intelligence agency, Kim was given a new name, OK Hua, and was sent to live in a compound outside of Pyongyang. It was called Kumsung Military College, and the only reason why we know the name is because when she was interviewed about her past, she may have accidentally mentioned the name in passing. When asked about it again during the interview, she never brought it up, with the implications being that the name of this military college was meant to be top secret. Kim would spend seven years at this military college, learning all different forms of martial arts, learning how to fine tune her acting skills, and learning how to use different types of spycraft. One of her first missions after training was to kidnap her Japanese language instructor. This woman would join a group of many Japanese people who would be kidnapped by the North Korean government, with these kidnappings occurring between 1977 and 1983. After the successful completion of her kidnapping, she was sent back to the military college for further training and indoctrination. Her and many other spy trainees would be shown propaganda films to assure their allegiances and loyalty to the North Korean government. After that rigorous training, she was sent to Macau to learn Cantonese. This is so that she could pose as a Chinese woman for future missions that would take place in China. She was also encouraged to explore Macau so she could become more normal. She was explicitly told to explore supermarkets, discos, and use credit cards, things that were completely foreign to any North Korean citizen. They wanted Kim to appear as normal and worldly as possible, because her next mission was going to be her most important and most sensitive. She needed to blend in. Before her flight on November 29th, 1987, Kim was ordered to travel through Europe with an older man, known to her as Kim Sung Il. This traveling excursion was to prepare her for a mission of great importance to the ruling Kim family. Whilst traveling with this man, she was given fake Japanese passports, and the entire time, their story was that they were traveling together as father and daughter, with their traveling agenda being a flight from Pyongyang to Moscow, and then from Moscow to Budapest. And from Budapest, they'd fly to Baghdad. And from there, Kim was told to board one plane, Flight 858 from Baghdad to Seoul, South Korea. Once landing in Baghdad, Kim was given a handwritten letter from Kim Jong-il and was instructed to place bombs under particular seats in the plane, and if the bombs successfully destroyed the plane and all the people on it, she would be able to return and live with her family and would not have to work as an agent afterward. On the plane, she wasn't known as Kim. She was known as Hachia Mayumi. That was the name on her fake Japanese passport. And quickly after boarding the plane, Kim hid two bombs along with a remote radio device and then attempted to disembark the plane, claiming that she was ill and as a result no longer wanted to ride. They would leave quickly and then board another plane to Bahrain. And once they were in the sky, the bombs they had placed on Korean Air Flight 858 would explode. 
A total of 115 people on board were killed, 104 being passengers. 113 of the passengers were South Korean, many of them being construction workers who were flying from Baghdad back home. The explosion took place above the Andaman Sea, and unfortunately the wreckage of the plane was never found and is believed to be at the bottom of the ocean. Word spread fast about this terrorist attack, and it wouldn't take long for Kim and her associate to be arrested in Bahrain. Both terrorists tried to kill themselves with cyanide capsules that were hidden inside of cigarettes. Her accomplice was successful though. His mouth was already foaming by the time they put handcuffs on him, but Kim was a little sloppy and was prevented from taking her suicide pill. Even though she was unsuccessful at not getting arrested, she was still a heavily trained secret agent for the North Korean government. They were completely ready for Kim to not share anything about her plans concerning this terrorist attack. They anticipated that she would be nearly immune to most interrogation methods. But to their surprise, she would crack and spill everything after eight days of constant interrogation. She would quickly be extradited to South Korea so that she could face the realities of her crimes. And when she had landed in South Korea, specifically Seoul, she was immediately sentenced to death. But the South Korean president at the time would pardon her, claiming that she had been brainwashed by the North Korean government and she wasn't wholly responsible for her actions that day. As of right now, she's a free woman and she's gone on to write many autobiographies about her life, one of them being Tears of My Soul, which was relatively popular and all the proceeds gained from that book went to the families of her victims. But even with this good deed, many people to this day view her as a terrorist and a vicious murderer. This is the city of Genoa. It's the capital of the Italian region, Liguria, and it's home to over 500,000 people. Its location on the sea has made the city very wealthy and both historically and culturally significant for the Italian people for centuries. And as a result, there's many things to learn about this town and those who have historically lived there. And one of those individuals was named Lazarus and Johannes Colorado. And yes, there is a significant reason as to why he has two names. You see, this man was a performer and what he would showcase was his body. You see, Lazarus and Johannes shared a body. Johannes was the upper body and Lazarus was the body embedded in Johannes's chest. Lazarus only had an upper torso, a head, a leg, and two misshapen arms. He was completely nonverbal and had his eyes shut all of the time. But for a fee, you were allowed to touch Lazarus and see how he'd react. It was reported that if you touched him, his ears, hands, and lips would slightly move. Lazarus and Johannes' entertainment career was mostly done through traveling freak shows. They were performing Basel, Switzerland, Copenhagen, Denmark, and Scotland, and their audience would be very diverse. Both the rich and poor alike wanted to see a parasitic twin, most likely for the first time. And that's how they would live their life. They would perform and they would go back home, with the most notable thing about their personal life being how Johannes avoided a murder charge. The French government and police department were looking into him for a possible murder. Who Johannes killed is unknown. What is known is how he avoided the charges. When found guilty, he would be immediately given a death sentence, but before Johannes left the court, he lamented and argued, saying that if the French government decided to kill him for this crime, they would be killing his innocent brother Lazarus. And because it was the 17th century, there was no reliable way to separate the two brothers so that Johannes could actually receive his punishment. So all that was left for the court to do was to release Johannes and let him and his brother live out their shared lives together. The date of their death is unknown, but historians hypothesize that they may have died at or around 1646. What exactly is a joke? And I'm not asking for its definition. We all know what a joke is. We all know what its denotation is. What's the connotation? What counts as a joke? What makes something funny? What can we make fun of? I want you to think about that while I tell you this story because what happened, while disturbing, many people online found amusing. So much so, there was a small community made around the joke, and the beginning of all of it would take place in Sasebo. It's the second biggest city in the Nagasaki prefecture, and for the longest time, it was only locally notable. The city had a historical significance, specifically because of the city's port. It was utilized heavily during World War II, but as of now, it's known for something else. Because 20 years ago, on June 1st, 2004, the city of Sasebo would encounter a serious and violent tragedy. This is Natsumi Suji, 
born November 21st, 1992, and by 2004, she was 11 and attending the Okubo Elementary School located in Sasebo. According to her teachers and her peers, she had an extraordinary intellect with an approximate IQ of 140. She was noted as an achieving student, often seen immersed in her hobbies, reading, drawing manga, and writing poetry. But her interest took a turn. She was very, very interested in violent Japanese films, specifically Battle Royale, which is a movie that depicted the violent deaths of an entire class of Japanese students, with the twist being that all the deaths were perpetrated by their fellow peers, with the hope of being the last to survive. Natsumi was completely immersed and obsessed with this concept. The media that she would consume and the things that she would talk about were all about murder. Her fascination with the macabre didn't even stop at films. She would create a website that would host videos of death, violent hentai, and gore most of the content focusing on mutilation. And that's key here, because her interest in mutilation encouraged to act out her fantasies in a very specific way. Because on June 1st, 2004, Natsumi Suji would manipulate and blindfold an old friend of hers. Her name was Satomi Mitarai. Natsumi lured Satomi into an empty classroom, where she tricked her friend into thinking that she wanted to play a game, and to play the game properly, Satomi needed to be blindfolded. A few moments after Satomi put the blindfold on, Natsumi pulled a box cutter out of her pocket and quickly slashed Satomi's throat. But that was only the beginning. Natsumi didn't stop. The young girl inflicted multiple additional cuts on Satomi's arms, and it wouldn't be long until Satomi died from massive blood loss. From there, Natsumi packed up all of her things and walked calmly out of the classroom. But unfortunately for Natsumi, she neglected to clean her clothes. Her hands, arms, and torso were covered in blood. So when she walked to her next period, her teacher noticing the blood-soaked clothes and box cutter in her possession immediately raised an alarm. Emergency medical services were summoned, but upon their arrival, they found Satomi's lifeless body. And in the meantime, Natsumi was being investigated and arrested. And when asked if she killed Satomi, she simply responded with, I did something wrong, right? I'm sorry. Natsumi would quickly be placed in a holding cell where additional interrogations would occur. She would go into detail about why she went out of her way to kill her friend. Natsumi said that she killed Satomi because Satomi had made a comment on her weight and body online. Natsumi felt slandered and felt like she needed to do something about it. So she retrieved a box cutter, either from her home or from school, and decided to do what she did. Natsumi's name and her age were unknown for a short period. Because she was a minor, much of that information was privated. But because this crime was committed by an 11-year-old girl, many individuals on the internet wanted to really know who Natsumi was. And because she was 11, it wasn't like any of her personal information was difficult to find. Much of the conversation about what she did and who she was occurred on image boards, specifically Futaba and 2chan. And her story would spread like wildfire. She became a disturbing meme overnight and was nicknamed Navadatan. Many people found it amusing and interesting that an 11-year-old girl was capable of such a gruesome murder. And because Natsumi was interested in gore videos and violent content online, many users on 4chan, 2chan, and Futaba identified themselves with her and thought of her as some sort of cute, murderous anime character. Many jokes, memes, and artistic images were created around Navadatan. There was a small internet community that were completely enthralled with this individual and what she had done. And during all of this, she was receiving psychiatric treatment. Because she was 11, they couldn't put her in jail, but she could not be around other students. And after four years of being isolated to a psychiatric treatment facility, she would be sent to an actual prison. It wouldn't be until 2013 until she would be released. She was 20 years old, and she had spent her entire teenage years in a juvenile prison. Her name was changed to protect her privacy, and her whereabouts are unknown. Yet the legacy of Nevada Tan persists. The Guilford National Forest, located in Washington State, is described as a hiker's delight. With a land area greater than 1.3 million acres, many of the people who choose to explore this national forest are experts at it. A lot of them are seasoned hikers who know the national forest like the back of their hand. But of course, the national forest isn't only for expert hikers. There are plenty of clearly marked trails that anybody can follow that showcase the beauty of the park while keeping you safe at the same time. But what if you're not an expert? What if you're just a moderate hiker and you decide to go off the marked path? I'm going to share with you a story of someone who did exactly that, and why they haven't been seen alive since June 9th, 2013. This is Maureen Lenawea K. 
Kelly. She and her family are Pacific Islanders, and the way that she was raised and the beliefs that she maintained led her to want to have a spiritual quest after she graduated high school. Her personality was incredibly carefree. Her friends described her as a laid-back girl, and her behaviors would absolutely emphasize that. She wanted to be a singer and songwriter, and she would post her songs onto YouTube, with many of her videos featuring her playing a ukulele, all while singing at the same time. And in between all of that, Maureen decided that she was ready for her spiritual journey, and she chose Gifford National Forest as a place to do it. On June 9, 2013, she left her friends, who also joined her on this journey, around 5 p.m. She planned on meeting back with her friends around midnight. That's when her friends noticed her taking off her shoes, her clothes, and she was only going to wear a fanny pack around her waist that contained knives, matches, and a compass. Then she walked right into the forest. Some time would pass, and she failed to rendezvous with her friends. At this point, it was June 10th, in the early hours of the morning. Her friends would contact the police, and a missing persons report would be filed. And from there, a rescue attempt had begun, and many people started searching the forest. Of the 1.3 million acres, only four square miles was searched for her, and nothing turned up. Her fanny pack wasn't found, a campsite wasn't found, nothing was found that would indicate that a woman was lost in the forest. This was incredibly concerning because many of the investigators and rescuers noted that the forest wasn't completely flat, it was basically a valley. Once you exit the trail and enter the forest, there are very steep hills and cliffs that you could encounter by accident. And one of the many theories as to what happened to Maureen was that she may have fallen down a steep hill and seriously injured herself. And because she was in the middle of the forest, it would be very difficult for people to find her, even if she was screaming for help. As the days marched on, things became more and more dire. From the beginning of the search, dogs were unable to get a trace of her smell, making tracking her down incredibly difficult. And when asked and interviewed, one of the rescuers said, you could literally walk right on top of somebody if they're rolled under a log, and you would never know it. And that statement is very important. The forest near the trails were pretty tidy. There wasn't a whole lot of dead material on the ground, but deeper into the forest, there's less maintenance, making it even more difficult for them to find Maureen. It would be 10 days until the search was called off. Maureen's family protested, asking for an extension, and her case is still open, but active investigation has been almost non-existent, with the main theory being that her disappearance was accidental. There wasn't any evidence found of foul play or suicide, so many people believe that she succumbed to her environment. You see, as the night progressed on June 9th, temperatures in the forest dropped significantly, and it rained. Many rescuers and investigators believe she simply succumbed to hypothermia, and her body remains somewhere to be found in the middle of that giant forest. According to the National Weather Service, jumping into cold water can trigger involuntary gasping, rapid breathing, or hyperventilating due to the sudden shock of sudden immersion. And that's not to be taken lightly. Even the most skilled swimmers forget how to swim in cold water. The temperature and sensation of nearly frozen water is that jarring to the senses. But there are many ways to survive if you do fall into a frozen lake. In most situations like that, you're able to prop your body up on the cracked ice. All you have to do is kick your legs behind you and slowly nudge your way up onto the ice. Kicking your legs behind you makes you buoyant. It makes it easier for you to crawl back onto the ice. But that tactic is only useful in an ideal situation. What if you were to jump into a lake and immediately be pulled under the ice? What could you do then? The woman you saw jump into the lake was a Russian lawyer. She was 40 years old and a mother of two. And to celebrate the Orthodox Epiphany, she wanted to jump into a frozen river. Little did this woman know that the river was still running under the ice and the current was incredibly strong. As soon as she jumped in, everyone around immediately knew something was wrong. The plan was for her to jump down vertically, but she instead jumped at a slight angle that made her catch the current, and it was just strong enough to pull her under the ice, making it incredibly difficult for anyone to rescue her. It also didn't help that the river water was murky and it was dark out. All of these factors led to her rescue being almost impossible. Her husband jumped in quickly, but he couldn't find her. 
her children were in the background watching. The father would eventually crawl out of the ice after not being able to find his wife. The husband would go on to call the authorities, and they would send a scuba diver to try and retrieve her. At this point, there was some optimism that maybe she could be rescued, but as the night progressed, expectations changed to a recovery. As of now, her body has not been recovered and is presumed to have been carried down the length of the river. Hello, hello everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's newest installment of the r slash morbid reality series, and if you did, let me know in the comments down below, and leave a like if you liked the video, and if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe fam, what you doing watching videos and not subscribing? And if you're old, make sure you hit that bell so you get the notifications every time. I seriously enjoy making these videos for you guys, so you guys make it really, really easy for me when you comment, like, share, all that stuff. So I will continue to find crazier and crazier stories to tell, and I hope today's video was able to satisfy that hunger. And as always, I gotta thank the Patreon supporters that make content like this possible. A big thank you to Convicted Poopslinger, Libby131, Dawnbreaker Drake, Traffic Racer124, YSG, Inferno, Fisherman, Tariq Hamid, The Blurred Star, Mr. Sandman, Iconic PFP, Mike, Sleepy Dragon, Power Lover, Loving Tate, Tron Destroy 23, Co Connor Purvis, S16, Infrared, My Golden Experience, James Tucker, BMX30, Cinnamon Sticks, Scott, The Fake Musician, Samantha Bellhart, Bloody Hunter, Keeley, Dundernass Hawk, Swiss Patreon user, and Noah. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description one in my merch store and one in my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so I can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.